Uh, you probably grab one of these. Hi, guys. Uh, so I'm Jesse Hempel from Wired, and I'm joined here by, and this is the first time I'm getting to see these guys, Jason. It's Koji. Nice to meet you, Koji. Good to meet you, Jesse. All right, and um, I think we, we got Brian somewhere. Right hey, Brian, nice to meet you. Come on out. I'll take this chair. You guys jump up here. Um, so the title of our conversation is um, we're going to be talking about content creation um, for uh, virtual reality. Um, how will pros and consumers create 360 3D and virtual reality content? Um, and this isn't so much the title of one conversation, but the nagging question for the industry right now in many ways. And the three people that we have on our panel are all involved in the actual creation of the hardware and in some instances also very thoughtful about um, what that hardware, well in all instances, very thoughtful about what that hardware is going to do. So before we jump into that conversation, I'm going to have each of our panelists introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about the work that they're doing at their respective companies. Jason, just because I know you already, I'm going to pick on you first. Uh, tell us about Lytro. Sure. So I'm CEO of Lytro, and at Lytro, we're building uh, light field capture systems. And, and just quick explanation of what the light field is. So uh, light field refers to the idea of, um, of all the rays of light flowing in every direction in a given space uh, versus just a traditional flat 2D image. And so what we aspire to do with our products for both virtual reality and film and television production is, is capture the light field, which gives you new powers in terms of creating super immersive six degree of freedom VR content, uh, kind of really game changing in terms of the way that people are starting to make uh, movies and television and incorporate visual effects uh, and a whole bunch of other things that we'll hopefully get to. Totally. And that is, um, that is a new and different Lytro than many people in the audience might be familiar with. So we will go into that in a few minutes. But uh, Brian, tell us a little bit about what you do at Facebook. You know, my name is Brian Cabral. I'm a director of engineering at Facebook. And we've been building and are about to open source a 360 3D um, stereoscopic camera. Um, perhaps the most novel thing about it is it's, being, it's open source. Um, and the whole goal is like with a lot of our efforts at Facebook is to actually engage all of you in building the, the, you know, a, new me a new medium. And we didn't think we could do it simply by ourselves. We felt that if we could inject some technology into the marketplace and engage everyone, we could actually move the technology faster both in terms of the artistic creative aspects, getting more cameras out there so more people are shooting and learning how to shoot with them, and also to improve the technology, because I think we're really at the, at the beginning. I don't look at what we're doing as finished in any sense of the word. And so that's what we've been doing, and it's pretty exciting. Awesome, and we'll go into that a bit further uh, too. But first, Koji, I want, us to tell you, want you to tell us a little bit about what you do at Jaunt. Sure, so my name is Koji Gardner. I'm the VP of Hardware Engineering at Jaunt. Um, so at John, our mission is to enable creatives to make immersive VR experiences. And so to that end, we've created an uh, end-to-end tool set for capturing, uh, stitching together, and ultimately distributing VR content. And so my role at John is working on the capture side. So we've developed a uh, full VR camera system that we designed for the ground up specifically for VR. Um, called the Jaunt One Camera, and that is a professional tool that we're making available with our partners to create VR content, which then moves through to our software and stitching algorithms and ultimately through distribution on our app. Um, so that's what we're working on, is basically this tool set to uh, enable people who are interested in making VR content make that a reality. Um, and so, Koji, let's, let's stay on that for a second. Who are the people who are likely to be using that tool? Are they folks like me? Are they folks in Hollywood? Sure. So we're working with a wide range of different partners. Um, just to start with, you know, we're building a professional tool. So it's not a, uh, a tool for consumers, per se. Um, but we're working with a number of verticals. So we're working with musicians, with content creators in Hollywood, um, with industries such as sports who are interested in creating VR content. Um, but we're also, you know, making these tools available to a new crop of VR content creators. We're working with um, the USC Film School, for instance, making, you know, young filmmakers who have ideas that 
maybe aren't so steeped in you know the culture of cinema as it's been written for the past hundred years to try to help jumpstart and figure out what this language is going to be about. Fair enough. Um, so let's come back to Lytro a second, Jason. Um, when you arrived at Lytro, it was a different kind of business. Tell us a little bit about how you got to here. In fact, I think a year and a half ago, I wrote a story and we talked about a different kind of company. Yeah, that was about two years ago. But two years uh, ago, so you, you know how things move in, in internet time, right? So, so uh, basically, so, that's like three decades. So you know, Lytro was actually founded about ten years ago in two thousand six uh, around this notion of uh, light field capture and content creation really being the next wave in uh, in imaging. Evan talked about this a little bit in his uh, in his approach, but the notion is, you know, if you can if you can capture the real world in three D at very high fidelity, uh, play it back through a variety of devices, both 2D and 3D, uh, this should really fundamentally change the way that we think about cameras in general. And it's about going from uh, 175 years of history where cameras have really been defined by hardware and optics uh, to a world where they're largely software defined. So if you can capture all the rays of light, you can then manipulate that in software. Uh, capturing the real world becomes much more like uh, computer graphics, which gives you a lot of flexibility and new capabilities. And so the way Lytro started is we, we started by going down the consumer path. So try, uh, building two generations of consumer light field cameras. And then along the way, realized uh, r really two things. One, we were seeing this incredible interest and demand for the technology uh, at the ultra high end of the market. So you know, today we're working similar group of customers that, uh, that Koji mentioned. So uh, Hollywood Studios and uh, new VR startups and gaming companies uh, who've really embraced the need for high fidelity 3D capture. And so that's where we're spending all of our time today. Um, and what did this require from you as a company over the course of the last year? Uh, we pretty much had to change just about everything. So, uh, yeah, so we, uh, we first, uh, we, we were all uh, ready to... Is it to fair to call this, is this, is this the Silicon Valley definition of a pivot? Of a pivot. Yeah, th th this is maybe an extreme version of the pivot. So, you know, we went from uh, a, a consumer electronics uh, company to a high-end enterprise company. Uh, first, we were focused on uh, still photography in the consumer space. Now we focus on only video and VR uh, at, the, at the very high end. Got it. Um, and so you're selling to a high-end customer, that's sort of Hollywood folks. You guys are selling to high-end customers and also mid-range customers. Um, Facebook, you're basically giving the family jewels away for free, which is very Facebook, mind you. Facebook is doing that in a lot of different places. Um, Facebook, you know, began as a software company. So the very idea that Facebook has hired people to go mutzing around with hardware in the first place is kind of a new and interesting idea. I mean, yes and no. Um, we do a lot of hardware, a lot more than people think. You know, building the world's largest data centers isn't exactly hardware free. Um, I'll give you that. <laughs> um, uh, so there's a fair amount of expertise there that is, you know, you don't see, you only, you only see the bits on the screen. Um, and certainly with our internet.org, we're building drones, and that is hardware. Um, so there is, is a little bit more in our DNA than just software. Um, but uh, as Jason pointed out, uh, all of us build computational cameras. And the compute part is pretty important. And that's why uh, we felt that we had technology we could inject into the marketplace. It, it wasn't that we saw this hole, kind of gap, between kind of what you're doing and you know, consumer monoscopic 360 cameras, which are great. And we said, could we add a little bit more to bootstrap this ecosystem? And we had expertise, we had resources. Um, a lot of the algorithms that we're talking about are interestingly related to machine learning, which we have a big investment in. So it just felt like this was burgeoning. We could add a lot to it. We could grow this uh, ecosystem quite a bit. Got it. Um, this is the universal sign to raise our mics when we talk. Yeah. Um, so uh, you guys announced this camera. I think I, I first saw this camera pop up on the internet um, in April. Yep. It, the components for which will be available sometime in the summer. Yep. Um, how expensive is this going to be? Who's likely to be able to use it? Yeah, so the cost is around 30 k in, in bill of materials. Um, could it be made cheaper? Absolutely. And we hope that people take our designs and run with them and, and drive the cost down. If there's anything I'm, I could bet on, it's the ability for... Uh, a lot of the people in this room and Silicon Valley to drive costs down. Um, 
a lot of the cost right now is just because we chose off the shelf components and we felt that that was pretty important. Fair enough. So this camera will come to market. Will that Will the fact of Facebook doing this have an impact on either of the businesses that you guys are in? I think, I mean, I'd, I'd look at it from a different perspective, and I think we, 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 the three of us have all talked about this uh, before, so I think we agree, which is, you know, we're in this interesting evolution where you really want to draw a distinction between uh, 360 video, which is, like, really a, a, an important first step, uh, and, then what, and then actually creating virtual reality content, which is, you know, we, we, at least at Lytro, we would define as fully immersive, six degree of freedom, really making you feel like you're in an environment that doesn't physically exist. Right. Um, and I think, you know, what, what Facebook is doing, which, uh, which I think is great for the industry, is they're making that first step, uh, creating lots of high quality 360 degree video content, uh, much easier and more accessible and better. And that should hopefully drive the whole industry towards uh, really uh, the ability to create true VR content. Yeah, agreed. And I think Brian and I were talking just this morning. Um, we're at a point now where the technology is there to create the capture systems to be able to at least start to make seamless 360 3D video. Um, and that's just the starting point. Now that that's there, we need to get that technology into the hands of people who will create the content and start to figure out you know, what works, what doesn't, how can we actually make compelling content in this new medium. Um, so let's talk about the content for a few minutes. It's a natural place to go. Um, you know, I, I think, Brian, you sent me a note back this morning saying, yeah, but, you know, there's some real new challenges to telling stories in this new medium. So we're the very, I'm just going to say, earliest uh, sort of point when it comes to figuring out how to tell stories. What are you guys seeing and learning? So uh, we're learning a ton, and we're making a lot of mistakes along the way. And you know, some of the things are not obvious at first sight. I think a lot of the things that are tried first are the sorts of ways that traditional filmmaking is done. So to give an example, um, one of the things I think all of us struggle with in 360 VR is how do you do a cut, right? How do you go from one scene to another um, in a way that makes sense in VR? Um, and that's something, to give an example, we, we did a piece last year. It was a horror film where in the VR scene you are basically a captive and you're in a room and we want to transition from that room to another place. And we did it first by just cutting between scenes and maybe trying to fade to black, fade back in. And it didn't work, you just didn't feel like you were transported. Um, so one of our producers had an interesting idea which is let's have your captors come up to you, put a bag over the camera so you're blinded, then fade to black, fade back into a different scene, pull the bag off your head, and now you're in a different place. And it was a First very simple... First of all, simple, that's terrifying. It's terrifying, absolutely. And that's why, you know, it was a horror film. And not only did it really put you into the action, but it actually really worked. You felt like, I'm going blind and now I'm somewhere else. So those are the sorts of, I think, exciting new creative ways that people are using this technology that um, is really great to see. Yeah, and I think maybe to add a historical perspective on it, so one of the things that makes VR super exciting and very challenging right now is that it's really the first medium in media where, uh, where the format and the way that you tell the story hasn't been defined at the birth of the medium, right? So if you think, if you go back 100 years and think about movies, uh, from the very first movie, we were kind of locked into this rectangular format of, of telling stories. And so we've now had 100 years of innovation around how do you tell a story well in that medium. VR kind of strips away all those boundaries, opens up all these new opportunities. But I, I also think that um, you know, anybody who tells you that they know how to create great VR content, either A, is lying, or B, has never tried it before. Because it is, it, it is, I mean, you guys agree, it's all experimental right now, and there are going to be some really successful things, and then a huge number of, of things that fail, and we'll be like, oh, why did we ever think that would work? Right. Yeah, and so certainly almost all the even simple things that you, you'd think would be easy aren't. Lighting, for instance. Every scene you shoot, your illumination is in the scene, whether it's sun, if we were shooting the stage, we have really bright lights. You don't have hoods on the camera, cowling on the camera as much. Um, all of these things you take for granted are just not there anymore. Um, 
it opens a bunch of new opportunities up as well in terms of storytelling. We recently did a shot up the street and at Grand Central Station, which was pretty epic. Um, but try shooting in a space that big um, with a lot of actors. The sound was incredibly bad because it's basically hard surfaces. The lighting is challenging. Everything about it is challenging. And then you go in and say, what type of story am I trying to tell in that environment? Um, and you're going to continue to see people push that envelope on what stories can I tell and what, which ones just don't work. And, and how do we evolve our, our, even our stage setting. Like this stage setting is a 2D stage setting. Yeah. Um, you know what it makes me think of? Uh, so a good friend of mine was uh, early at Second Life. You remember Second Life? And he was telling me about how early on they were like, wouldn't it be cool if people could get their mail at Second Life? They could get their email by taking their avatars and walking down the driveway and going to a mailbox and opening the mailbox and taking the email out of the mailbox. And in fact, it wasn't cool because it turns out it's just much easier to just check your email. Mm. Um, and it feels to me similarly like you guys are, we are all in that phase of VR content creation where we're like, wouldn't it be cool if, and then we discover some things actually aren't so cool. So what have, we, what have we definitively discovered so far? So, so I think that's a, a great example of things that seem cool before you try them and you put somebody in a headset and see what happens to them. Um, and you know, one of the things that a lot of people try right now is let's just have action everywhere, right? Let's force the user to look around because it's 360. And unless there's a really good reason to do that, it, it just makes you uncomfortable, right? You have to stand around and move around. And there are some things like when you have two characters speaking to each other, there's distances that work and there's some that don't. You don't want one person here and one person over there because you're caught kind of in the middle bouncing back and forth. So these are the sorts of things where until you try it, the concept and what actually people are going to experience might not jibe. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so what do you think the relationship will end up being between 360 degree and 3D uh, photography and VR? Is, is one a Band-Aid while we get ourselves to the other, or is there a place in the future for both? I definitely think it's a continuum. I think that in the same way, uh, if you look at Facebook today, right, you have pictures and you have videos. Uh, there, are, there are different uh, times and experiences and use cases where one makes sense versus the other. But I think that um, what you will see from all of us here is that we're all going to keep kind of pushing the bounds of what are possible uh, in, in across all those different mediums. Also, um, one of the, another interesting thing is a certain zeitgeist is happening right now, I think, with both the input and output and the distribution technology. If you really look at all the pieces, the, the work that we're doing on capture, the display technologies, all of that kind of come, is coming together. And in fact, the camera we built, we could not have built five years ago. We just couldn't have um, for a whole bunch of technological and 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 cost reasons. Um, same thing with displays. Displays are getting better, and both in terms of AR and VR and group immersive experiences. That is going to continue to accelerate. And as it accelerates, we'll see a much more of a convergence, both in the storytelling and in how we build the technology. Um, so what are the, what are the next sort of three things that you guys would like to see happen to basically amplify or speed up that acceleration? Certainly from our end, just more content creation. And not just for the sake of content creation, but in order for the technology to evolve and for to be able to tell those rich stories, you have to try to tell a lot of stories. Um, and if only a handful of people are doing it, it's not going to be enough um, if we really want the, the ecosystem to grow. Fair enough. I think along those lines, at, you know, the display and the headset technology is still at a very early point, right? There's, once that initial wow factor is over, there, there's still a lot of artifacts you see. And, and getting over that to the next step is, is something that's happening very quickly. I think, as Brian mentioned, you know, display technology, cell phones have been driving that forward at an incredible pace for the past five, six years. That will only continue. And VR is really now giving the handset manufacturers a reason to up the pixel density. It's actually an interesting thing we found by talking to headset manufacturers is they are now interested in making their phones VR capable. Um, and that's something that I think will continue to drive adoption um, amongst people who have smartphones. Um 
what is the role of the consumer, the amateur, if you want to call somebody like me that, versus the pro at this point when it comes to content creation? Good. They all lift their microphones. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, so I think uh, the, the way that we look at it, right, is that um, the first thing that all of us need to do is create great, consumer experiences, right? So we need to, between uh, Facebook, John, and Lytra, like we need to make VR so good, so compelling that, uh, you know, either at work or at home, you want to put on a headset, whether it's a, your, your phone or a, or a higher-end device like an Oculus, uh, because what you can get out of that is just so cool uh, and so amazing and so different than you can get any, anywhere else. So I think that's job one. Uh, I think that if we all do that well and we're all working very, very hard uh, to do that, then what we would hope to do is uh, kind of inspire in you stories that you want to go tell or, or experiences that you want to create. Uh, for other people uh, in, in this new medium. Uh, but I, I, I may be more pessimistic than these guys, but I think we are uh, at the extreme early end of, uh, of making that possible and, and useful. So I think you know, people have uh, described where we are in VR today as being like the first iPhone circa 2007. I, in my view, I think we're much more similar to the first IBM PC, you know, when the monitor was like this big green uh, CRT thing. So a lot, of, a, a lot of aspects of the ecosystem have to get a lot better uh, before I think there will be great consumer-created content for VR. And now with that said, I think that one interesting thing is, is happening as well is that inexpensive 360 cameras, while not you may be glorious in the super immersive experience, it is great to start seeing people shoot with this all the time, um, even if it's monoscopic, because it is a natural bridge. So I think I do, I do like the fact that um, we're seeing it at kind of all parts of the spectrum, and it starts to give that visual language uh, to early adopters, like, like my kids will start shooting with 360, they'll get that language. In 10 years, they'll just they'll know the language. And so I think it is important, even if, if it's kind of awkward at first. Um, I think it's great. I, I'm glad to see that there is a, a full spectrum of technology from yours clear down to you know, a handheld device. Yeah, no doubt. I, I think you know, I have a bit of a counterpoint to that in that um, you know, one of the reasons we're focusing on high-end content creation to begin with is we do see that there's a bit of a risk in VR for uh, user-generated content that doesn't take into account what VR can do to your bodies. And so one of the things we learned very quickly is if you don't stabilize the heck out of your shot, you put on a headset, you're going to feel sick. Yes. And that's a visceral experience that can pull people out of you know, wanting to experience VR. And that's something that we early on learned and decided, you know, let's, let's make sure that things we capture and put out there are not gonna make you sick. Um, it's, it's something where even something as simple as mounting a camera to a car that's accelerating can give you that weird sense of head and body not matching. It's like when you're at an airport on a moving walkway and you get to the end and your brain thinks you should still be moving at a certain speed but your body's saying no. And it's that disconnect that, you know, if you don't take care to make sure you don't make the user sick and have problems. So you would go so far, Koji, as to say that to put this into the hands of consumers too soon threatens to hold back the industry because folks like my wife, who already is not quite sold on VR, is going to be like, oh, why would I want this? I, I would say that there's a risk of that. I mean, there's a risk of user-generated VR content causing people to feel sick in VR and that hindering the adoption of VR. What do you guys think about that? Yes and no. <laughs> um, I think that, as someone who just open sourced a camera. Yeah, I think that that um, uh, you, I, I guess I have great faith in in humanity in the sense that um, people will learn how not to do that. Some will get it wrong, and they won't have successful. If they're trying to shoot for like a small business and they start doing that, they're not going to be in the small business for very long. Um, that's one. And number two, if we're going to t widely learn this new language, we have to give a lot of 
uh, books out there. I mean, there was this, during early uh, printing press times, there was this worry, oh, if we give these out to too many people, they're all going to, you know, we don't know what they're going to do. Um, and, 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 and the fact is, yes, we don't know what they're going to do, but I have faith in humanity that they'll fi fig figure it out. So I'm, I'm kind of pro-democratization of technology, um, and there's going to be bumps along the way. So there's going to be a bunch of people that don't get it right, and so we yet we'll learn. Yeah, I, th I think it'll be a lot like the uh, the early days of the App Store and Google Play and and uh, iTunes, right? Where where the cream will rise to the top. There will be a lot of there were a lot of crappy apps. Then there will be some bad VR uh, th that we'll see. But I think that it'll get sorted out, and and that consumers will kind of vote with their eyes in terms of what they watch and what gets promoted and distributed. Now. If it to the degree that you can say, I mean, it, do we need sort of one killer piece of content, like the movie that everybody has to see, or it, or does the future of the success of VR depend on filling the pipeline with so much fairly compelling stuff that there's something for everyone? I think one killer piece of content would be would be great for all of us. I mean, you know, we're still again, we're so early, right? We're talking to this room where people know what VR is and most people have tried on a headset, but you go elsewhere in the country in the world and it's not that way. So, getting people to pick up a headset for the first time and to have something like, you know, say the Game of Thrones of VR that people get excited about, tell each other about that, you know, brings us upswell of community. That I think would be very helpful. Yeah, I think pe people talk about this notion of an Angry Birds moment in VR, right? Kind of, if Angry Birds was kind of the first breakout uh, hit that you could only get on a on a smartphone, uh, I think there will absolutely be that equivalent in VR. I think you know these guys are working super hard to make sure that uh, that developers and content creators uh, are are seated and funded and, and enabled to do that, along with a lot of other people. And I think what's uh, what's really hard to predict is just when will that happen. I would I would guess it probably won't happen this year. Uh, good chance it'll happen next year, and, and if not, uh, certainly by 2018. So maybe next year. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, having been through uh, several evolutions of related technologies, this feels a lot like the mid-90s in computer graphics. Artists were looking at early computer graphics and saying, oh, it's too plasticky, we'll never be able to create something creative with it, why are you bothering, you know, this just isn't going to work. And John Lasseter took a, a plastic ball and a couple of lights and bounced them around and showed that you could create emotion with with computer graphics and the rest is history, as they say. Um, it did take a long time for that to, to fully gestate, but I think that that's going to inevitably happen. When exactly? I'm not sure, but if we get enough... Uh, equipment and technology out there. There's plenty of really creative people that I am totally confident it, it will happen. Um, so I, when we think about the, the magic of the content, I'd love to hear from each of you one example of what you find or have found to be the most profound thing that you have seen with VR. I do realize I'm asking you to narrow your babies down to one. It's definitely a lot, but I think I mean one piece that I thought was amazing that was uh, now uh, done almost a year and a half ago was uh, w there's a there's a VR studio called Verse uh, that's run by Chris Milk that probably some of you are, are familiar with. Uh, he made a piece called uh, Clouds Over Sidra, which was a VR experience around uh, the Syrian refugee crisis, and I thought that uh, kind of better than anything else. Uh, up to that point, and in some ways even now, uh, that demonstrated the power of, of VR to put you in a place uh, and, and have an experience that you would just never get conventionally and, and really connect on an emotional level with, with a very, very important thing that's going on uh, in a way that's just not possible with other technology. Let's just get a sense of our audience here before we continue. Who in the audience has seen that piece? Wow, so more than a third of our audience has seen that piece. So, Okay. Um, uh, for me, it, it, was, it was much more personal. Um, during the development of our camera, um, I had brought a headset home to show my dad what we, what we were working on. You know? And I expected the, oh, that's nice, son. Thank, thank you for showing it. But it was a shot of inside of our Facebook buildings, and it was just some of our colleagues. It was a test shot. But my dad immediately started asking me all about the people. Do you work with these people? How many in this room? This place is huge. How big is it? I had a full conversation as if he had visited Facebook. And given my dad's age, which is up there now, he, he wasn't going to go there. And at that moment, I was profoundly moved. I was profoundly moved because I didn't expect it. 
and I, I didn't hand that headset for to have that dialogue. And suddenly I realized the the per, kind of the profundity of of the technology. And I said, if that can happen here, it can happen anywhere. And so it it it, it really made me feel if we can get this out to enough people, it's going to change the world. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, for me, one of the pieces that the New York Times did called the displaced, I believe, um, following the. Uh, the lives of children who had been displaced by war and by famine across the world. Um, those types of documentary pieces that put you somewhere else in a situation but allows you to look around and actually feel transported are really powerful. Um, so I think documentary type filmmaking is really gives you a sense of objectivity that standard 2D frame documentaries don't. Um, so that's been a really powerful one. You know, so as I listen to this, I look at the three of you, and you all are, to some degree, hardware people. And you all just described these experiences that were extremely person-centered. And it makes me think back to what Gregor just said right before us. You know, he said, uh, we're not in this for the tech of it. Uh, we're in this for the, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, he didn't say this exactly, but for the, the human connection element of it, that aspect of it. Yeah, I'd like to touch on that a little bit. Um, a number of people have asked, you know, what, you know, what do you... How do you? What's your design point for your camera, um, in terms of quality and other things? And you know, we use resolution charts and all sorts of normal camera stuff to to test our cameras. But the measure that we used the most was looking at people's faces uh, in this kind of realm of ten to twenty feet. Could I emote with them? Could I look at them in the in their in their eyes and relate to them? And that was our, one of our most important metrics in making sure that we were nailing the type of quality we wanted. And yes, it was subjective. Yes, it was hard to quantify. But I knew it when it was there. My boss knew it was, it, it was there when it was there, et cetera, et cetera. It didn't require explaining lines per millimeter or pixels per degree or anything like that. So peop, it, it was critical, at least for us. Yeah, I think we, we would tell you, uh, and when we have in the whole company, we're about 80 people, uh, we have three hardware engineers and everybody else is a software engineer. And the way that we really um, think about and talk about what we're doing at Lytro is we talk about science for technology for art. So I mean, our, our customers are people who, exactly like you described, you know, people who are telling stories, people who want to create a human connection. And, and our job is really to enable them to do that better through technology. And that, that's kind of our centering point and where we focus. Yeah. Um, so in a second, I'm going to ask you guys for questions, but I'm just going to prep you first. We're going to end. I'm going to ask each of you one wish for the next year in your industry. So mull on that. Do we have any questions from the audience right here? Give us your name and... Uh... Sure, Rick Smolin. Um, I spent two days at the Tribeca Film Festival just a few weeks ago, and I saw something called Alomet that um, had me in tears. It was a 17-minute VR piece, absolutely breathtaking. It was animated. And it's nothing, it, I totally forgot I was wearing the headset. Everything else I've seen, it's been interesting. But this, I wanted to go back into that world again. Um, the second one I th saw was called the, um, the Blindness Diaries, which was, again, it was so unusual, I can't even describe it. And the third is my brother did one called the Click Effect, where you go underwater with a group of divers, and you look down, and there's whales swimming underneath you, and dolphins come up. And all three and of Rick, these And Rick, let's so move to your question just so we can get a few I more I was just going to ask, have you seen other things? You all talked about, actually... Um, like photojournalism, are there any animated things that, like Alamet that you recommend that this audience take a look at? Thank you. I think uh, you know another piece by that same studio. That was Penrose Studios who did that. This uh, another piece they have the Rose and I is quite good. Uh, I think that, uh, Henry, uh, which Oculus Story Studio did. I think there. I mean, if you go uh, and, and then uh, Invasion, which uh, Baobab. Did. If you if you go on either if you go to the John app or you go to uh, Oculus Share, you can find or not called that anymore. But uh, if if you go to the Oculus uh, content store, you can find a lot of really nice pieces like you're describing. Okay, time for one more question. Right back here. Yep. Hi, my name is Raphael Spring from Dot Product. Um, back in 2010 to 2012, I guess, we had this big craze about uh, 3D TV. Um, we all know where it went. And so what, what's different this time? Are we having another VR 
craze? Is this a bubble, or you know, what's what's different this time that makes it stick? Great question. So uh, I think for us, the, the turning point was when Google announced cardboard um, two summers ago, and it was the realization that everybody has a VR-capable device in their pocket. So with that, now you can get a very cheap experience with a cardboard type device or you know, bump up to something like the Gear VR, which still uses a cell phone as its display. Um, that makes the technology available to a huge audience. Um, 3D TVs, you had to go purchase a TV, um, and that's a big investment. And TVs, obviously, are something you don't purchase very often, whereas phones, you upgrade every couple of years. Um, so the user base, just by that fact alone, is a lot larger. I think also, just by a show of hands, who uh, here has seen any VR experience where the, after watching it, they're like, wow, that was incredible. I saw something new. Uh, I really like that. Um, so what did you say, about half the audience. Now, uh, same question. How many of you have ever seen uh, a 3D movie where you're like, wow, seeing it in 3D was so much better than uh, seeing it in a regular format? Okay. Not, a, not as few as I would think, but I, I, I would argue that you know, 3D movies and 3D TV were uh, a gimmick in terms of a way to drive increased ticket prices and get people back to the movies, but they didn't fundamentally uh, enhance the storytelling experience. I think the, the power and the promise of VR is to really bring this new medium uh, to consumers and professionals and, and enterprise, and we are absolutely at the earliest stages of that, but, uh, but I'm very optimistic that it'll end up uh, getting there. And I would just say as a business reporter that it's a question of top down versus bottom up. Follow what consumers want versus follow what it makes sense for manufacturers to try to monetize. We didn't want 3D TVs. Um, OK, one wish. We'll start with Koji for the next year. So I think following on what I mentioned before, I think smartphone manufacturers continuing to adopt VR technology. Samsung's already doing it. I would love to see Apple jump on that. Um, because one of my greatest regrets right now is I, I have an iPhone, and there are a few headsets that are good out there, but nothing is integrated and as nice as the Gear VR. So having that continue to move over the next year is, is a great wish. Got it. Um, I would love to see um, 3, 360 3D content coming out at least weekly, if not daily, that there'd be, we'd be sitting here and just we'd have dozens to choose from awesome. all the time. I, yeah. Totally. Just to make an interesting all end on a skeptical note. So I think that uh, you know we, we've seen such incredible excitement and hype around VR. We are inevitably headed for what I call the VR crash, right? Where uh, folks like Jesse start writing articles. Oh, it was overhyped. It'll never work. Uh, totally what was everybody? <laughs> what, what, what was everybody talking about? And so, so my wish is that in the face of that, which is just is going to happen, uh, that. Uh, you know, all the people here, all the people in this room uh, keep innovating and working because I will tell you that the future of VR is going to be awesome and we just got to uh, keep working on it. Um, thank you, you guys. I think you all nailed it. All of your wishes will come true by my edict, by Evan's edict. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very thank much, you. Jesse and the whole panel.